Today, we have taken a shift, I don't know whether you noticed it or not, from what happened Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, and what we're talking about now. Christmas Eve, and those services that run through the 25th of December, are a celebration of events. We talk about shepherds, Mary, no room, born in the stable, Jesus, angels appearing, glory to God in the highest, and all of the things that we just sang about, it, the wonderful Wesley hymn, God, heart and her angel sing. But the tenor of the colic and the lessons takes us from the celebration of events to something that's actually far more personal. You see, it is possible to, in essence, be a tourist when it comes to Christmas, which means you can show up at a church service, you can hear the lessons, and you can observe events, hear the story about what happened some 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem, and yet actually have very little of it have an impact on your heart, on your life. You are, in fact, a tourist. You come to observe, you come to enjoy even, the beautiful music, the aesthetics of the service, the, the kind of warm feeling that it brings to your heart. But as I told the people on this receive, that warm feeling is not necessarily a sign of you moving from tourist to participant. It's just the aesthetic impact of what lovely things, sights, and sounds can bring to our senses. Certainly not wrong by any stretch of the imagination. I believe in aesthetics. But there is, in fact, a deeper reality than aesthetics and the warm feeling that they might bring. It has to do with our relationship and how we enter in, not merely observe, but enter in to this reality that we are commemorating and giving thanks, thanks for the birth of God's own Son. To use John's language in the Gospel lesson, the Word made flesh. And it really starts out with a colic. If you will be kind enough to turn to the lessons that are in your leaflet. One of the purposes of the colic is to set a thematic tone to the service. And Hammer and others who can be have done a masterful job. They still hold up hundreds of years later. And notice what we are asking God to do in the collect. Almighty God, you have poured upon us the new light of your incarnate word. We, as your sons and daughters, this is the assumption, have already received that which you are pouring out, but we know that you're not done with us yet. And so when we pray, grant that this light, what? Enkindled. You know the term, it means to be set on fire. On fire in our hearts may shine forth in our lives. So we have gone, you see, from the celebration of events to asking God to allow those events and all that they bring to have a very personal impact on our hearts. Moving, as it were, from tourists to participants. And the assumption this morning, as you were here, not one of those CNA Christmas and Easter Christians, but choosing to be here on a Sunday morning way after December 25th, is that you're saying, in some ways, and this is why the prayer is this morning, I've signed up. I want to be a participant. I do not want to be merely a tourist. I want the work that happened in Bethlehem. And in fact, to happen in my heart. In my heart. And the whole thrust of the lessons gives us that assumption and talks about how it happened. And really, the best way to look at it is Galatians. So turn with me, if you will, over to the Galatian reading. Paul is describing a kind of before and an after. And it has to do with two different ways of relating to God. The before has to do with, notice now, before faith came. That's the after. What was our state? We were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith could be revealed. What's he talking about? 
The law, the operation of the law, as it happened within the context of the Old Testament, was this. These were the commandments that God gave us, both the ten that made us know, as well as the wholeness of others. And our job, if we are going to be pleasing to God, is to obey the commandments that have been given to us. And how I relate to God is that I relate to God, who has given a standard for human behavior, and my job is to try to do the best I can to live up to that standard. That's what it means that I to live under the law. And in that light, who God is, is someone in fact quite distant. And credit and that my ability to be able to communicate with him, talk with him, relate to him, uh, have any kind of blessing of God on my life, has everything to do with whether or not I fulfill the things that the law requires. If I do, then God likes me. If I don't, then God does not. And, and you know that comes out in all kinds of different ways. Like, for example, when someone is ill and we pray for them, have you heard the phrase, Oh Lord, she's, she's such a good person. Please come in. In other words, what we're doing is that we're asking God to pour out a blessing predicated on this person's good behavior. You've heard it. Now you're at that we're, we're talking together here. And, and it can come out in a lot of other ways, too, that, you know, we, we talk about the question about heaven and eternal life, and it comes out in the sense of, well, here's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping that in the end, on the scale of justice, the good outweighs the bad, and based on the fact that hopefully the good's going to outweigh the bad, then that's how God is going to let me in. Which means, if I'm approaching toward the end of my life, that I have some things to make up for. And there's some things I need to take care of that perhaps I didn't take care of when I was younger. Um, even Jonathan Edwards had a famous phrase that one of my commitments to the new year is to make sure that I don't do anything that I wouldn't want to do the last hour of my life. Now that's not a bad resolution, but all of that is an understanding of what it means to in fact live under the idea that my job is to do the things that God asks and that God's relationship really is predicated on my behavior. And it's worse, it sort of like God being kind of Santa Claus in the sky. You know who's making the list that checking that twice? I want to say that what Paul lays out in Galatians and what John lays out in the Gospels is a different way of relating to God. And I want to say it different in its entirety. It is a whole different understanding of what God has done for us in Jesus. Look, in the middle of God, the Galatian reading, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law. In other words, someone who takes upon himself, God does in Christ, all of what it means to be human. I can never say to God, you don't know what it's like down here. Because you see, that's exactly what Jesus knows. Fully human in every way. Born under the law, fully obedient to that which the law requires. But to do what? To help us be better law keepers? No. But to redeem those that were under the law. In other words, literally take them out from under what Paul describes in that first verse as a prison. Did you hear that? Before faith came, we were in prison. Because there is a tremendously detrimental effect to living out my relationship with God under that kind of Santa Claus mindset. It means I'm in fact really quite insecure in my relationship with God. Because I actually believe that God's feelings about me are predicated on my behavior. So that means intercessory prayer is tough. Because I don't know whether God likes me today or not. Whether I'm better he's listening to me at this point. Or maybe he has better things to do than deal with me who continues to never just not get it right. The other thing that happens is, is that not only am I insecure in my relationship with God, but because there's this striving thing in me, if I'm taking this seriously, then I, I, I get so because I am conscious, clearly conscious. The more I read the scriptures, the more I 
I see what we see in the life of Jesus and his perfection and the things that the scriptures ask of me, the more I'm conscious of the fact that I cannot live up to this. That there is this painful gap between what the scripture requires and what's actually true in my life. Is this that true for you? I hear that. Come on. Romans to the <laughs> And therefore, not only am I secure in my relationship with God, there's this always this sort of, although I try not to pay attention to it, this sort of non guilt inside of me. That I'm hoping maybe if I get to church, it will get assuaged in some way or another. So I feel that. Right? And at its worst, it can shape that kind of living in the law can shape a kind of personality that is not only extraordinarily suffering, because I keep trying all the time and I know I'm not living up, but also becomes critical of others. You can see it. Most people who are gossipy and critical are critical of other people so that somehow they can feel slightly superior and better for themselves. Putting down another person makes me feel better. I don't have it quite as bad as she does, or he does, or so. You don't look like that, don't you? You know, not your head. In other words, that kind of insecurity, both in myself and with God, has a tremendously deleterious effect on my relationships with people. It, it makes me far less prone to forgive, far more likely to hold grudges. Because they did not do what I wanted, or I can't, I'm having a very hard time for forgiving so and so because of what he or she has done to me. There's always a list inside with a person like this. And it has everything to do with how I relate to myself. Because I've always had a list too, even though I may mean, not tell you that. <laughs> but because I actually think God has a list. All of that. Is characteristic of what it means to live under law and the demand of living under law. But well, Paul says it is a prison, and Jesus has come to get you out, to get you out of that kind of prison. Because what he is desiring to do is shift our relationship from God as judge lawgiver, me as not very good at law keeping, critical of myself and of others, to someone who comes into a place that's not characterized by law and judgment, but is characterized by mercy. Mercy based not on my performance, but mercy based on relationship. And that's what it means to be adopted. So, in order to redeem, in other words, get you out of that person, of those under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. Now, any parent knows, any child knows that, that we don't always do what our parents want. Right? I hear that. I've got a son in the audience who will gladly admit to this. I admit the same in terms of the expectation of my parents. But does that change the fact that I love my son? Not at all. He's my son forever. Hello? So the whole nature of our relationships, it, it's not that there aren't any expectations. Of course there are. We're still called to live in a way that really reflects God's goodness and mercy. But it's a different approach, an entirely different approach. You see, there will never be a point where I look at my son and say, you are never my son anymore. I don't want to see you. I couldn't imagine. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Right? Not your head. <laughs> so it is with God. If we have been adopted as his children, that means the whole basis of our relationship shifts. It's no longer predicated on does God like me or not. That's an assumption. I've been adopted. I've been brought into the family. That means literally, no matter what I've done, I can come into His presence. I can pour out the very worst that is inside of my heart. I can be transparently honest about everything, even the things I don't want to admit to myself. 
And know that at no point will God come and say to me, that's it, I've heard about it, get out. See, I've been adopted. And it's something that I receive so that I can receive adoption as children, as sons and daughters. And that's children, Paul goes on to say, because you are children, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You know what Abba is? It's a, it's a very tender and intimate term of endearment. If you go to Israel to this very day, and you happen to be on a place where the bus is dropping off kids, and dads are waiting for their children and moms, and they, if the children begin to call out their fathers, the term they still use is, Abba, Abba. So it is with us. That what God has given us in Christ is that He has placed literally the very Spirit of His Son into our hearts. That means the very same Spirit which is in Jesus and has been in Jesus is now in us. I bear the family likeness. And that I can come into the presence of God no matter what my condition with all of the confidence of the world of knowing that I will not be rejected. I can do this. And out of that, I can know something entirely new about God. I don't have to fear His rejection. Instead, I know His tenderness, His forgiveness. I know His mercy. You see, that's what grace is, to use John's language. Grace and truth came. In Jesus Christ. Grace being God pouring out upon me favor that I in no way deserve, but I'm so glad to receive. That's grace. And that's what God gives His children, His sons and daughters, who have been adopted into the family. And what we pray at the beginning, the cup is that God would take that gift that He is pouring out upon us and set it on fire in our hearts so that it flows not only in us, but through us. That we know not only His forgiveness and mercy, but it changes how we see ourselves. We're able to forgive ourselves. We're able to forgive others. It flows through us into a new kind of life. The lists begin to go away. Life becomes way too short and totally inappropriate to hold their resentments and keep the lists alive. It's just not behavior. It's demeaning. It's just not behavior appropriate to those who are God's adopted sons and daughters. Because you see, if God but the way it is, if the law is no longer in effect, if I have received this child, that means I'm his. He's not keeping up the sire. He is not Santa Claus in the sky. He's just the opposite. Someone who loves us faithfully and dearly, who is very quick to forgive. I mean, the whole reason we can come to God in repentance and ask for his forgiveness is because we are sure on the front end, before we ever open our mouths, that He is there to forgive. Because, as the scripture says, He knows whereof we are made. He remembers that we are but dust. And we have, in the very depths of the Holy Trinity, the risen flesh of Jesus, who knows precisely what it is. And that's what we carry with us. Long, long after the Christmas season is over. Howard Thurman, an African-American preacher, put it this way. When the song of the angels is still, when the star of the sky is gone, when the kings and the princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work of Christmas begins. What is it? To make music in our hearts. There is a song because we know that we are redeemed and forgiven. There is a joy and a, a vitality that we bring to life because we know we enter into life in the companionship of this presence. We know that even when we face the worst that life has to offer, 
we still face that knowing that we are in Him and He is in us and He will never let us go. That's why we can gather together and see the kind of joyful things that we do. We're not naive. We're not Pollyanna. We're not just somehow trying to block out all the problems that are out there. Because after all, most of them are in here too, right? No. We can say, rejoice, receive the Eucharist, welcome those who remain received with a vitality because we know that we are part of God's family and that He will never let us go. He will never let us go. We can be free. We can share the things that God has given us. We can give money. We can be a part of what God is doing. We can live generously as service because God has been more generous to us than we could ever, ever deserve. We no longer are hoarders, hide our forgiveness, or our treasure because if Jesus gave it away, so will we. How can we do less? It's a life of vitality. And I think it really wonders this. So, here's the question Are you living under the law? Or do you know who you are as God's adopted child? And there are plenty of Christians who sing all the right hymns all the right words, but in our hearts they are forever law keepers, law demanders, and that's how they live their life. Oh, don't be one of those. Living lives full of bitterness, unforgiveness, fear, demanding. There is kindness to God that we need to receive. And that kindness is everything to do coming in a new way to see both who he is and who we are as adopted children. So the beauty and joy of what we see in Christmas is not something we observe as a Christ, but we enjoy in our hearts. Let us pray. Gracious we thank you that you're coming among us in the form of an infant and hallowing what it means to be human. You can you join heaven and earth, flesh and spirit, and invite us to come and stand with you and to know the joy of heaven and earth, flesh and spirit, joined together in our hearts to be adopted and to know that we are yours and you will never let us. Oh, Father, I do pray that you would, as we have prayed, enkindle that reality in us. That no matter what we face, no matter what this year brings, we may always know the vitality, the power, and the life of your unending presence surrounding us, enfolding us, and holding us in the palm of your hand. For we are your children. You are our God. And you will never let us go. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray.